Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is a companion video. What are companion videos? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked to see every day on the John Campia live stream that we do Monday through Friday. We take a lot of live open questions from you guys, but we don't often have time to get around to all the questions that get sent in. But I want to make sure that we give each and every one of those questions that get sent in some video time to get answered properly. So I collect those unused questions up and we address them here on companion videos. And what a day it's been, guys. Oh, first of all, what a couple of days it's been. I mean, Game of Thrones. Possibly the most pop culturally relevant, maybe one of the most successful, if not the most successful television program of all time uh, came to an end last night. And there's been some division about whether or not this has been a good season or not. I think it's been bloody fantastic. A bunch of people don't think it was all that good. All fine. But what you can't deny is the, the pop cultural force of nature that this series has been. I've never seen a television show so immerse and so take over pop culture uh, ever in my life. I mean, it's been absolutely crazy. For some, it's, it ended on a strong note. For others, on a weak note, whatever. But it, whichever side of the fence you fall on on that, you got to acknowledge, man, what a run that show has had. What an absolutely monstrous run that show has had. And it's now come to an end. And now every other network out there, guys, every other network out there right now is like scurrying around trying to figure out what's our next Game of Thrones, right? It's funny because as all the TV networks now are trying to come up with their next show, you never heard people say, what's our next Battlestar Galactica? You never hear the networks scrambling around for the next big show and calling, what's our next Sons of Anarchy? And those are my favorite shows of all time, by the way. You don't. But now with all these networks scrambling out, they're all the terminology being used in the industry is all these networks are now trying to find their next Game of Thrones. Everybody's trying to find the next Game of Thrones. That's how ridiculously popular this show has been. It's nuts. And again, whichever side of the aisle you fall on that this was a great season like me, this was a terrible season like others, you can't deny what a force this show has been. So kudos to HBO, to the people behind the cameras and in front of Game of Thrones for what they pulled off because we've never seen anything like it. Never seen anything like it. And we may not ever see anything like it again We'll have to see what happens once The Witcher comes out, once his Dark Materials comes out, once The Lord of the Rings show comes out. Lots of stuff to see, but I'm sure we'll get around to it. Okay, anyway, what we're here to do is get caught up on those questions that people sent in. So let's not waste any more time and get right to it. Anthony R. writes, I don't watch Supergirl, but I saw a clip of the Monitor arriving. I was surprised. Uh, they're really pushing this crisis crossover five parts I heard. Yeah, listen, every year, the CW, for those of you who don't know, in their Arrowverse, they do a crossover event every year. They've done it in the early days of Green Arrow and Flash, when it just used to be Green Arrow and Flash. Then they started including Supergirl. Then they had Legends of Tomorrow in it. They've got a big one coming up this next year, which apparently is going to mark the end of Green Arrow. And it's going to be the end of the Green Arrow show. And they're already starting to lay the groundwork for it. It's been, Now, this past year's was all right. The year before that, Crisis on Earth X was fabulous. Um, they've done some really, really great ones, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they're going to do next year as well. All right. Troy Strauss writes, John, Vegas got Bran right because there were massive Game of Thrones season eight plot details leaked online weeks ago that were proved right after each episode. Um, I've heard that before, but I've also heard that, no, they just kind of saw that some of their odd makers just saw that going right back to season one. So I don't know if the Vegas line had anything to do with that, to be honest with you. It may. It may. I, I just don't know for sure. But it is crazy that Bran did end up on the throne. Again, it made no sense to me when I first heard the theory that Bran could end up on the throne. And then when I'm hearing Tyrion describe why he should be on the throne, I'm like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Actually, me and Rob were both like that. We're both like, oh, hell, that makes a lot of sense. He should be on the throne. Anyway, kind of like the way that turned out. All right. Next up, Kevin Lewis writes, Plot holes are manure, stinks, but make flowers. Sometimes, sometimes plot holes are just awful. Most of the time, plot holes are just awful. But I've often said that, look, I love Endgame, uh, Avengers Endgame. It is full of plot holes. And I've heard a lot of the scapegoat excuses. People are like, no, you can explain the plot. No, 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 those are just scapegoat excuses. There are plot holes in Endgame. But I'm fine with those plot holes in Endgame because like you said, yeah, they're plot holes, but they made something beautiful happen. Like because 
X plot hole was there, this amazing moment was able to happen in the movie. And I wouldn't trade that plot hole if I had to sacrifice that marvelous part of the movie. So that, that's just kind of my point of view because it's part of the reason why I loved it so much. All right, uh, Suthius writes, Hey guys, from acquisition of Marvel to Pixar to Lucasfilm to the theme park expansions and introducing new parks, Iger is really something else. No, seriously, Bob Iger is the most brilliant executive maybe in the world. And a lot of people got to remember, Disney is not, we in the movie fan communities, we think about Disney and we think of it in terms of its movies. Right, We think of it in terms of Disney movies, Pixar movies, Lucasfilm movies, Marvel movies, what have you. And that's understandable because we're in movie circles. Disney is such a broader company than that. And Bob Iger has been the high lord and emperor in charge of like some of the most massive expansion and growth in the history of the company. And you really can't overemphasize how brilliantly he has run that thing. And, you know, then he got Alan Horn to come in and run the whole movie division. It's just been, it's amazing. It's amazing. And Bob Iger, you can trust, because that dude is just one hell of a genius. Doesn't mean he's done everything right, not at all. But man, what he's done with that company is insane. Uh, Suthius writes, just watched the trailer for HBO's His Dark Materials with James McAvoy and Daphne Keene. Looks pretty neat, I'm intrigued. Yeah, we talked about that on the John Campus show earlier today. And you know, a lot of people feel about His Dark Materials the way we felt about Watchmen for a lot of years that <clears throat> a lot of people just felt like the Cimmerillion that it's just not a filmable thing great books that won't really translate well remember they made the Golden Compass years ago and that sucked but I gotta tell you man I saw that trailer and I'm with you I'm intrigued not the best trailer I've ever seen but it was enough to get me intrigued it's like wow you know what I'm, I'm willing to give this another shot because it does look intriguing let's see how this all turns out all right Brandon Blake writes in 19 or in 1492, Arya sailed the ocean blue. Of course, one of the big endings to Game of Thrones. And look, it's it's on television. It's been revealed to the public, so we are going to talk Game of Thrones spoilers here. But um, I thought one of the more interesting things was Arya just sailing off west of Westeros. And you could do an entire spin-off series on that. Maybe they will at some point. I don't know, but I thought it was a very interesting ending for her. Uh, Patrick Conway writes. Frasier, Friends, and Timeless had the best finales. Nothing beats Star Trek The Next Generation's finale. It's not even my favorite show of all time, but that is how you wrap up a show. Frasier definitely was a great ending. With him going, I believe it was Chicago he went off to. Frasier had a great ending. I don't quite remember the Friends ending, and I never watched Timeless, so I have, I have no idea about the Timeless one. But to me, still all time will be All Good Things, the name of the... Uh, two-part finale for Star Trek The Next Generation. It's just a masterclass on how to wrap up a series. Anyway, Suthius writes, it's not who you are underneath, it's what you do, this is from Batman, it's what you do that defines you. One of my favorite quotes ever in a film slash life, Batman begins, if you didn't get, oh I do, it's when Rachel uh, runs into Bruce again. And he goes, you know, I'm, I'm more than this. And she goes, you know, you might still be that great guy underneath, but it's not who you are, it's what you do that defines you. It's powerful stuff. It's powerful stuff. I really do like that line. I like that line a lot. Um, okay, Kevin Lewis writes, Phase 5, more anticipated. X-Men, Fantastic Four, in MCU Phase 4, epilogue of Infinity Saga. Um, I don't know what you mean. Like... Phase four epilogue, of, I don't know what that means. So let's just stick with the first part of your question here. What's more anticipated, the X-Men or Fantastic Four? I gotta believe X-Men, just because it's such a bigger, broader, far more pro popular property than the Fantastic Four. Now, at the same time, there's a lot of desire and hunger out there for Fantastic Four because it's been done wrong so many times, right? It's, I mean, three Fantastic Four movies, Three strikes and you're out. I mean, it's just, it's really unfortunate that it turned out that way. That being said, um, I, I think, again, X-Men, the more popular brand, the more successful comic book. Uh, it's had some great movies, some not so good ones, but some all-time great ones as well. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess, at least for me, and I think for most people, it's going to be X-Men. Uh, Gus Sanchez writes, have you heard anything about the tax collector? All I know about the tax collector and this is enough to get me intrigued, is that it stars Shia LaBeouf, who, while a complete 
completely cracked. Like this guy is completely off his rocker. He is one of the world's great actors. It's being directed by David Ayer. Of course, the two of them worked together on that movie Fury, which I think is excellent. And Shia LaBeouf was excellent in it. That's all I know. I've seen pictures of Shia LaBeouf, like all tatted up for it and stuff like that. I'm intrigued. But honestly, details other than that, I have no idea. I don't even know when the damn thing is supposed to hit theaters. If it's going to hit theaters, I just don't know. But that's as much as I know, but that's enough to get me intrigued. Hardcore Curtsy writes, I really relate to that horse in John Wick. Uh, I would do the same thing if someone spanked me without asking. Well, obviously, I can't talk about that because I don't want to give away anything to people who haven't seen the movie yet. Uh, Zachary Buckler writes, my dad predicted who would win the Iron Throne in season one. Me. Hey, you were right, dad. What did it cost me? Everything. Very funny. Um, yeah, there are some people who like dug up old things showing that they were like in the beginning. Ah, I bet you that kid ends up on the throne. And I guess in retrospect, now we can look back and in hindsight, I suppose we can look back and maybe see little signs pointing towards that at the time. But uh, all I can tell you is that I never would have guessed it. Hell, we got halfway through this season. I still never would have guessed it. But I do like the way it turned out and the way Tyrion kind of explained it made perfect sense. So kudos to your dad for being one of the early predictors. Uh, John Michael Lozada writes, uh, Drogon Burns chair, Bran, no, pro <laughs> no problem, already got one. Some people are sending around these great memes about with uh, the Iron Throne as as a wheelchair, which is great. Brand the broken lung, may he live. I think, look, he didn't speak much this season, but every time he opened his mouth, the dude was dropping bombs, right? Everything from the things we do for love. Ooh, sick burn. Uh, everything from I'm just waiting for a friend or you've been, it's brought you, everything you've done has brought you right here to where you belong, home. Oh, beautiful. Or even in this thing, why do you think I came all the way? Just Open his mouth, dropping bombs. I love that character this year. I really did. Uh, Kevin Lewis writes, Did you ever see Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman? Custer's Last Stand was great. No. That movie is like from like 1970, 1971, 1972, somewhere in there. I, that's a Dustin Hoffman film I've never seen. And I remember because a friend of mine, do you remember a couple of years ago there was a, a little bit of controversy dusting up about Dustin Hoffman? Anyway, it started a conversation about some great Dustin Hoffman films. And my friend brought that one up. It's like, you know what? I've never seen that one. Still to this day, I haven't seen it. One of these days, I got to get around to watching that, though, Kevin. Thanks for putting it back on my radar. All right. Syrian Douglas writes, Once upon a time in Hollywood, debuting at cons tomorrow. Cannot wait to hear about this film. Shaping up to be really spectacular. I mean, I don't know how it's shaping up. All I know is this. You got Quentin Tarantino, one of the great filmmakers of our generation doing it. You got Brad Pitt, Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean... You've got a stellar cast in a very interesting time period. A lot of things could be cool. Now, what's interesting on top of all this is Quentin Tarantino's been pulling a little bit of a Russo Brothers with the Avengers. He's been sending out notes to people who are going to be seeing Khan, uh, seeing the movie at Khan's, saying, please do not spoil this. So apparently there's some big, something big and twisty happens in the film. And Quentin Tarantino is getting ahead of it right now, begging people who see the movie, do not spoil it. Do not spoil it. So clearly something pretty major happens in it. I'm looking forward to seeing what it is. Maybe it reveals that all of Quentin Tarantino's film are all one big shared universe. I doubt it. But wouldn't that be funny? Okay. Uh, Doshi writes, if Captain America is America's bottom, then Deadpool is can. Oh, you mean America's ass. Yes. Yeah, sorry. It won't let me say the actual word. No problem. Yes, right. From Saskatchewan, Canada, Deadpool. Wade Wilson, he is Canada's ass. I think I can get behind that. I can get behind that one, Doshi. All right, Mad1306 writes, uh, You was right, John, about the book scene in John Wick 3. I love the dog scenes, too. Again, I don't want to give anything away for those of you who haven't seen John Wick 3. Bloody magnificent movie. Such a fun thrill ride of a movie. And all I tell people when they're going into it is, watch out for the book scene. You've seen it, so now you know what I'm talking about. Also, the dogs in this. Look, we see in the trailers the dogs jumping into action as well. I thought that would be about it. No, lots of dog in this, and I love all the way they do the dog stuff, and it just go on in and enjoy the film. All right, Orange Hand writes, Hey, John and friends, as silly as that Game of Thrones petition is, is there any 
is there any scenario where an artist or creator changing or redoing their work is justified? No, unless that's what they choose to do on their own. Um, there is creators should not take their direction from the audience should never be that way ever. If the audience knew what the hell they were doing, they'd be the artists and they're not. That doesn't mean we're stupid. That, that doesn't mean those of us who are audience members are stupid. Not at all. But they're the filmmakers. They're the creators. They're the artists. Let them do their art. And then let us either enjoy it or not enjoy it. But the artists and creators should never take their direction from us. They should never take their direction from the audience. Ever. It is our job to whine and bitch and complain and praise and cheer and applaud. That's our job as an audience. That's what we do. That doesn't mean the, the, the creators should dictate or be dictated to what they should do with their art. So no, unless it's something that they on their own choose to do. An example of that is George Lucas with his Star Wars films. He decided to do special editions. I don't like the special editions, but he had every right to do that. They're his films, his creation. He decided he wanted to do that on his own. Therefore, he has every right to do it. Should a creator or artist ever submit to the, the audience though? No, never. That's when you start getting junk, 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 junk art. Uh, so no, I don't think so. That's just my opinion though. Again, our job is to whine, bitch, moan, complain, cheer, applaud, and, and praise. That's our job as audiences. That's what we get to do. The artists should do what they do. Hey, that's just my thought on that. Anyway, Kellel writes, uh, got a day off over here in Canada. Nice. Just wanted to say I love your work. John, Ashley, Rob, Ray, and Jonathan. Also, the, uh, and also to the movie fan community. Thank you so much, Kellel, for sending that in. It's always nice when somebody just wants to write in to say something nice. Not just to us here on the show, but to the rest of the community here as well. Thank you, man. And I hope you've had a fabulous day off up in my home country of Canada. Uh, Isaac uh, Sanga writes, Long-time Game of Thrones fan, so disappointed in Season 8. Oh, and that's unfortunate, Isaac. Again, to me, magnificent season. I loved it. I, I loved every bit of it. It did feel rushed. And that's my big complaint. It felt very rushed, especially in the last episode. But this season, to me, was so good. Game of Thrones was never in my top five favorite television shows of all time. It is now. And it's now in the number four spot for my all-time favorite show. Wasn't there before Season 8. Now it is. But different people feel differently about it. I know a lot of people who loved this season. I know a bunch of people who didn't like this season. And you know what? That's entertainment for you, brother. We watch something. We have a certain experience with it that's different from everybody else's experience. And we either like it or we don't. But we all still get to be fans together at the same time and still be friends. That's the great thing about this entertainment stuff, Isaac. So thanks for sharing your thoughts, man. All right. Uh, Dad Gad writes, who's scarier, John Wick or Thanos? I mean, John Wick comes at a dude so hard, the guy gave up his son to make him stop. I'm telling you what, dude. I said this to Robert this morning. I'll say it again. If you go back to Avengers Endgame and Cap is standing there on the battlefield and the portal opens behind him and just John Wick comes walking through the portal. I like Captain America and John Wick's chances against Thanos and his armies. Right there, all by themselves, I suddenly like their chances. Don't agree with me? Go see John Wick 3 and see what we're talking about. He is a scary, scary man. Uh, Daz Chia writes, uh, Iron Throne was innocent. Why did it have to die? There was something beautifully symbolic about that. But at the same time, a little forced. I don't know, like, uh, was the dragon just looking for something to melt and out of anger? Or was the dragon cognizant enough to know that has been what this is all about? That symbol, that chair is what all this has been about. And in the, in the moment of rage, he melts it. I don't know. It does seem a little bit forced to me, but at the same time, it was beautifully symbolic at the same time. But the chair was innocent. Um, Boy D of Ninja writes... Was Bran playing the game to become king? He sure did. He saw the future and could have warned people and saved the civilians, but he let them die. See, we, me and Robert talked about that this morning. I disagree. They have never portrayed Bran as being omniscient. He doesn't know all, nor does he see all. And they've never been really specific about, you know, what parts of the future he can see. 
And in the past, even when he was asked about it, Brandon, in an earlier episode this season, said, I mostly live in the past. That's where he mostly is for knowledge. He's mostly in the past. And even then, he didn't know for the longest time about John's true lineage until he was specifically looking for that in the past. Again, that's not the future. So the show to me has never suggested that Bran is all-knowing. He's not omniscient. So no, I, I don't buy into that theory. I can see why you'd feel that way. I can see why you say, wait a minute, this is those wizards. But the show's never kind of laid that out in that way. So I've never taken it that way personally. Rob agreed with me. Uh, we don't agree on a lot about this season, but he and I agreed on that one little thing. Uh, NPE writes, it wasn't Dexter final season bad, but it was close. I'm assuming we're talking about season eight. Again, I respect your opinion on that. I completely disagree. This season was magnificent in my opinion. Uh, Tyler Eklund writes, Sir Davos, I don't think I get a vote, but I, I love that line. And did he say, I don't think, or you say, I'm not sure I get a vote, but I, I did like that because when he went around, you think, okay, but who is Sir, what house does he lead at this point? So I love the fact that he threw that in. By the way, I've loved that character ever since he attacked King's Landing, right? I have loved this character and it was great seeing him there at the end as well. All right. John De Benedict writes. The guy at the council at the end uh, was Edmure Tully, Sansa Arya and Bran's uncle and their mother, Caitlin's brother, uh, the groom of the Red Wedding. I forgot that. I totally did. Yeah, because we were all talking. We were talking this morning about who was that guy again? I know it was Sansa's uncle, but who was he again? Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, you're absolutely right about that, John DeBenedict. Again, I'm not the world's biggest expert on Game of Thrones. I don't know the family lineages. I don't know. I've never read, nor will I ever read the books or anything like that. I'm just a TV fan, and I've loved what I've seen. But thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate that, John. All right. Altan writes, In 1973, Brando rejected, yes, he did, his godfather Oscar in protest of minorities portrayed in film. Did this act help change the industry? I think it was quite influential. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing is up for debate. For those of you who don't know, uh, Marlon Brando won an Academy Award, and instead of going himself, and let me see if I can remember this correctly, because I was, I think I was just born when this happened, but he decided to use that as an opportunity to bring awareness to the fact that Native Americans very have any voice or are ever given any voice, and he had. Uh, this woman go and give a speech for him and it, it was kind of a mess and all that kind of stuff but that is you can see how that has influenced where things have gone since now some may think that's a bad thing some may think that's a good thing whatever but i don't know if i would say it it helped the industry but did was it an influential event yeah i absolutely believe that that was definitely an influential of, uh, event whether that was a good influence bad influence that's up for you to decide but i thought it was definitely influential all right jaga writes Started seeing Lucifer after your recommendation, blew through season one, and now I can't stop. Please send help. God, I love this show. I know you guys might even be getting tired of hearing me rave about this show so much. But I cannot get enough of Lucifer. I cannot. Actually, I'm on my journey right now of watching it through for a second time. Season four for a second time. I blew through season four in three days. And now I've been going back and watching it with Anne uh, again. Last night, I got up to the second last episode. Probably later tonight, we'll watch the final episode again. I love this show. I'm so glad a number of you have picked up on it now and are watching yourselves now. That's awesome. If you haven't started watching Lucifer, start watching Lucifer because it's a hell of a fun show. All right. Everett Lewis writes, uh, watch the first episode after the finale. Oh, okay. You you watched the first episode of the show after the finale was done. I thought you were saying there was no episode after the finale. Okay. Watch the first episode of the show after the finale. And who is the first main character we see? Bran the Broken. Definitely rushed, but happy where everything landed. That's how I felt, particularly about the last episode. I was happy with every target they hit, with every milestone they cross. I was happy with every event. In the, in the thing, I just really felt like they rushed through it. I felt like everything that happened in that final episode could have felt better paced, more fleshed out and everything if it would happened over two or three episodes. You know what I mean? That was my biggest criticism of that episode. 
Overall, solid. I liked everything that happened. I liked where everything ended up. Again, I just wish they had taken more time, fleshed it out a bit more, and gave it better pace by having it happen over two or three episodes. Now, normally when we're talking about giving something better pace, we're talking about making it a little bit quicker, giving it a little bit more snappiness to it, tighten it up a bit, make it a little faster, give it a better pace. But in this case, I really think better pace would have been to give it more room to breathe. Um, Again, other than that, love where they ended up, but definitely I do think pace was an issue in that. I really do. Thanks a lot for that, Everett. Next up. Joshi writes, John Wick's success if it was a cat instead of a dog. For those of you guys who watch me, I'm not a cat person. I am not a cat person. Uh, you know, usually when somebody says, I have a pet cat, I go, I see, I understand. How long have you had this problem? Uh, that's usually my response. I'm clearly a dog guy. But I've grown up with cats. I, I've had pet cats in my family most of my life. But I am more of a dog guy. So, no. It would not have worked nearly as well had it been cats instead of a dog. It would have been, they killed my kitten. Oh, well, you killed my puppy, the world's going to burn. There's a big difference there. All right, Anthony R. writes, now cat lovers are getting mad at me. Uh, Anthony R. writes, John Wick 4 ad mortem, translation to death. I cannot wait for John Wick 4. I hope they go into production tomorrow. I want it in theaters in two months. That might be rushing it a little bit, I can grant it, but I cannot wait for John Wick 4. Okay. Alan Gonzalez writes, maybe is backwards. Maybe Dark Phoenix connects to Endgame. LOL, just a crazy idea. In the words of Vincent McMahon from the WWE, no chance in hell. They are not connecting this to the MCU whatsoever. They've been very clear this is the end of the line for this universe of X-Men films. And they're going to relaunch X-Men probably in a few years. Probably three, four, five years from now. But they are not. No chance in hell are they connecting Dark Phoenix to Endgame. (laughs) No chance. It is a crazy idea, and there's always room, Alan, for crazy ideas. But I'm just saying, don't hold your breath, because that ain't probably never going to happen. All right. MZOD780 writes, John Wick 3 is a flop. It made only $57 million, while Endgame made a bazillion dollars on the opening weekend. I am interpreting you as being a little bit facetious there. Obviously, John Wick is a massive success. That's a movie that, what do they make that for? Like, I think like 30, 30 million bucks, 30 something million dollars they made that movie for, as opposed to say Avengers Endgame, which costs over $350 million to make. So big difference there. Uh, as far as that goes. But yeah, for this John Wick made almost double on its opening weekend what the previous film did. That just goes to show you, I, I believe there's an object lesson here for all film studios. If you have a good idea for a movie and you make it and you make it well and the critics respond to it and the audiences like it, stick with it. Because look, the first John Wick movie didn't make any money. John Wick 2 barely made any money. But it, it did this kind of a trajectory, right? Because they made something fun, entertaining, that the critics liked, that the audience liked. And so we saw John Wick 2 have more success. So what did they do? They stuck with it. Then they made John Wick Chapter 3, biggest opening in the franchise's history by almost double. I really think this needs to be a good lesson to studios everywhere, particularly, I really hope right now, Warner Brothers in DC when it comes to Shazam. Okay, yeah. Did Shazam make all the money in the world? No. But guess what? You made a great film that the critics really liked and that the audiences really like, let John Wick be a guiding star here. If you can consi- if you stay consistent with it, keep putting excellence into it and stay the course, you're going to see growing exponential success. I love seeing that in John Wick 3. Here's hoping that more studios take notice of that. All right. Uh, Jesse writes, Hey, John, big fan. Thank you so much, Jesse. With the new Batman casting, I'm wondering uh, what happens to the supporting cast? Will they keep Jeremy Irons, J.K. Simmons, or will they be recast? It's a great question because is this even the same Batman we knew? Or have they just reduxed the entire Batman character? Is this even in the DCEU? You know, we've heard very wish-washy, non-committal answers to that question for the last two years. Is he in the DCEU? Well, he's sort of connected to the DC. No, no, no. Just just say yes or no. Is this the DCEU Batman or not? Because we had one DCEU Batman. Is this a rebooted DCEU Batman? 
Or is it something different? Well, it's sort of connected in the same sort of blah, blah. We've had all these wish-washing, non-committal answers that could be interpreted one way or the other. I just want a straight answer from them on this. Is this definitively the DCEU Batman or is it something else? I don't care what the answer is. I'm perfectly happy if it is the new DCU Batman, fine. I'm perfectly happy if it's not the DCU Batman, it's something else, fine. I'm good with that too. I would just love a, 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 a reinstated answer. But just getting to this one specific film, I can't see them bringing Jeremy Irons or J.K. Simmons back. It seems like if you've got a new Batman, you're going to have a new uh, Alfred, you're going to have a new Gordon, I think, but I don't know. I hope they keep them around because I love J.K. Simmons as Gordon. I love Jeremy Irons as Alfred. I just don't think that's what they're going to do, but I hope they do. Let's wait and find out. All right. Uh, Chris Pavoto writes, might have missed it. Full Batwoman thoughts. Um, yeah, I said this before. A couple things. There are a bunch of people saying that in the Batwoman, the Batwoman trailer is just a bunch of man bashing and stuff like that. I'm sorry. I watched the trailer. No, it wasn't. I never saw one slightest instance of men bashing in it at all. I heard some positive, affirmative, pro-women stuff. But pro-women is not anti-men. And I think some insecure men need to learn the difference about that. That being said, I thought the trailer was awful. <laughs> but I don't think it's awful because of why some other people thought, it's male bashing. No, it wasn't. It wasn't male bashing, but it wasn't good either. Again, some people may watch and think it looked great, and that's awesome. I celebrate that. That's wonderful. But if you're going to ask me, what did I think of the trailer? I thought it looked really piss poor. Uh, that did not pique my interest to watch that series at all. Like, not in the least. Uh, I just thought it was very, very poorly done. It looks like a very, very low effort show. I'm not interested. And, and that's really too bad because in the CW crossover event this past year, I did like their introduction of Batwoman. I thought it was actually pretty solid. So I've been curious about this Batwoman show. That trailer, though, has done it no favors. The trailer's done it no favors. But that's just my my thought on that. Okay. Matsif Jada writes, uh, 1994, Year of Pulp Fiction, True Lies, Shawshank, and Speed. Yes, it was. It was a great year. Uh, Andres Morton, uh, Morin writes, have you seen A Dog's Journey yet? Hashtag man tears. No, and I'll be straight up with you. One of the great things about not working for a corporate overlord, not having a boss, is that Unlike in ages past, when I working in this industry, where I had responsibility to see everything that was out there and blah, blah, blah. I don't have to watch movies that don't appeal to me anymore. And I will be honest with you. Dog's Journey does not appeal to me. But John, you're a dog guy. I'm totally a dog guy, but nothing about this movie looks good to me. Now, notice that I'm not saying the movie isn't good. I haven't seen it. I can't make that predict. I can't make that proclamation. I just know that nothing about it looks appealing to me, so I, I choose not to see it. But if you've seen it and you love it, that is awesome. But I, I haven't seen myself. I'm not planning on using any of my time to see it. That's just me. That's just me. All right. Uh, Madsif Jada follows up. Lion King mask, Ace Ventura, Dumb and Dumber, over under 50%. Oh, I remember that. You were asking over under 50% that 2019 it can be as good or better of a year than 1994. I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, we've had a couple of really great films so far this year. But we have not had a Shawshank Redemption this year. We have not had a True Lies this year, and we've not had a Pulp Fiction this year. Uh, we've had a big, fun, fantastic endgame, but that ain't Shawshank Redemption. Uh, we've had this magnificent John Wick 3. That's not True Lies. It's not Pulp Fiction. Those are better movies, um, in my opinion, at any rate. But there's a lot of years still to go. Uh, you know, the best films of the year don't generally start coming out until after the summer. So at this point, it's just too early even to take a guess. Like, how is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood going to be? How is a lot of the big Oscar contending films going to be when they eventually start coming out? So right now, I'll just take the middle of the line. I'll, I'll ride that 50% line, man. I'll just ride the 50% line. All right, Ben Rayner writes, should they, should they bill king DP, should they bill king DP? Deadpool as the last X-Men movie with Fox and really milk it, like putting past clips from previous movies and cast. 
Oh, Dark, Dark Phoenix, not Deadpool. Okay, guys, please don't use abbreviations when you're writing in messages because you le then you're leaving it to me just to interpret it on the fly. Okay, should they bilking Dark Phoenix as the last X-Men movie with Fox and really milking like putting past... Uh, well, they are doing that, Ben, as a matter of fact. They have been doing that. I know at CinemaCon, they were really making a big deal out of this. is the last film of this series. They did recently put out... Uh, these these clips you can find on YouTube kind of like celebrating the whole franchise leading up to Dark Phoenix. They probably should be doing it more. They've been doing it very quietly and subtly, but it's been there. They should probably be making more of an effort in it. But I don't know if they just don't want to put any more marketing money into this movie. Um, it looks like the, mov the movie's going to lose money. And now at this point, the more marketing money you spend, that's just probably more money you're going to lose. So it's a tough position for them to be in. I don't envy their position right now. Uh, Preston Walden writes, without, without trying not spoiling, without trying not spoiling anything, uh, was the near to last scene in John Wick 3, was that planned out by Wick and others or not? Obviously, I'm just going to say, I don't know. And I can't elaborate on it because I don't want to give anything away. Uh, so right now, I don't know. I'm wondering about that, but I simply don't know. All right, Evan Taman right? Really like Frasier's finale. Have you seen it? I have seen Frasier's finale. The whole sign-off scene, actually, and because I used to like Frasier a lot, um, the sign-off scene when he's doing his last broadcast on his radio talk show was really nice. And then, of course, he's on the plane, and, and that's where the series ends. A very, very good finale. Very good finale. Uh, I liked it quite a bit. It was a great show. Frasier was a great show. Uh, and then I believe this is the final question of the day. And then we are all caught up, guys. Final question of the day comes to us from uh, Deshaun Burnett, who writes, Do you guys watch Attack on Titan? If not, please check it out. One of the best anime series of all time, in my opinion. I'll be honest with you. I started watching Attack on Titan. I didn't find it very good. And I've got the, the comic in my room right now. And I've liked the comic. I didn't like the... the um, the, the screen version, though, the, for whatever reason, the screen version didn't really work for me, um, which was too bad because I read through a lot of the graphic uh, material and it's like, great. It's fascinating. It's an incredible mythology. Like the world they build is really kind of cool and all that kind of stuff. But then I watched a bit of the series. And I'm like, none of this is clicking for me. And I can't explain why. I don't think I've ever talked to Robert about it. I'd be curious to know his opinion on it. But I know several friends of mine who watch it, love it, adore it. And it's got all the right building blocks for something that I would like. But for whatever reason, it didn't just quite click with me. I'm not really sure why. It's an interesting question, though. All right, guys. That will do it for this installment of our companion videos. We're now all caught up. Hey, listen, guys. Thanks for being here and sending in all those questions for two reasons. Number one, by sending in those questions, you're giving us great fun topics to talk about. And number two, you're supporting the channel while you're doing it. And we really appreciate that you do that as well. Don't forget, guys, the next John Campus Show live stream happens tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Make sure you guys come on in and join us for a lot of fun stuff. We're already working on a bunch of our stories that we're going to be talking on tomorrow. You're not going to want to miss it. All right, guys, that'll do it for me for now. My name is John Campus. Thanks for being here. And until next time. Bye-bye.